You could smell Lola before you saw her. <laughs> April noticed the smell, of the, noticed the stench immediately. My dog-loving wife turned her face in disgust at the four-legged canine cradled in my arms. I was way too familiar with death that I didn't notice the odor. After a childhood with hospice in the living room, you grow numb to the aroma of raw flesh and decay. You have one unheard message. Hi, this is Pender County Sheriff Animal Control Unit. One of our officers found a neglected dog. She's chipped and registered to your address. We're closed on Monday for Memorial Day. On Tuesday, we open up at 8 a.m. It's $20, cash only, if you decide to claim the dog. Have a good weekend. My mother read the voicemail transcript aloud, but I didn't believe her. I would analyze every detail, word for word. I called her and gave her the boomer step-by-step -step instructions on how to forward the voicemail. I listened to the message over and over and over the next four days and three nights. What's the fee for? How long did chips last? Is she okay? Do dogs remember trauma? My brain was an overdrive of questions. There's only so much information on Google and Reddit threads about the conditions of lost dogs. 52% of chip dogs make it home successfully. This seemed like a shitty-ass statistic. This seemed like a sick joke. Lola wasn't our first family dog. Our first dog was CJ and was the result of my grandmother bribing the hospice nurse with $25. It was early 1991, hospice had given her weeks at best, but she needed company. No one wants to die alone. My mother was on her way from Boston with my sister and me, twin toddlers, and her 15-year-old cat. Caregiving would be a family affair. She was understandably upset to arrive at my grandmother's bedside to find a mutt ready for dinner and unconditional love. My mother said she would have taken the dog back to the pound, but it wouldn't stop licking my sister and me, and we were just too happy. She was concerned about her cat, who was already starting to get regularly assaulted by the suffocating embrace of two toddlers. But the house was big enough for everyone, and the cat would spend its remaining years hiding in my mom's room while CJ had free reign. The plan was temporary. We would stay until she passed, except my grandma didn't die. Not until eight years and three rounds of hospice had passed. My sister and I grew up in a house where the only entertainment wasn't TV, but slowly watching the life drain from someone whose short-term memory wouldn't retain our names. I wish we could have changed the, cha changed the channel, but love is watching someone die, even if that someone would never recognize you. I don't remember when the cat died, but my mom set us down like she had done before to deliver bad news. My mother choked on tears as she told us she had to put the cat down. And my sister lit up with joy and said, yes, I hated that cat. When my grandma died, CJ wouldn't move for weeks. She sat almost in a fetal position in the living room where the in-home hospital bed sat for nearly a decade. The imprint of four wheels would never leave the carpet. For high school, my sister and I were shipped off, shipped off to an all-girls boarding school hours away from home. When we came home for summer break our freshman year of high school, CJ was gone. My sister and I were both devastated. And my mom said, I didn't think you would care. She genuinely felt bad for putting down our first dog weeks before and never telling us. So she agreed we would get a new dog. Later that week, we were out shopping and there was a pet adoption fair at the shoe store. It seemed like destiny. <laughs> An hour later, we were leaving with a new dog. My sister named him Butthead. <laughs> it was midsummer and hot, so my mother decided we would drop the dog at home before finishing errands. We returned home again hours later to find that Butthead had chewed all the blinds to shreds. 
Almost as quickly as Butthead had found a home, he was sadly being returned. He was defective and we wanted a real dog. The next day, while driving to work in Pender County, my mom stopped in traffic when she saw something on the highway. It wasn't clear it was a dog at first, but it was Lola. She was abused and covered in fleas, but my mom thought she deserved a home. And after dropping a few hundred dollars at the vet, she decided this home was going to be our home. Our, family as a fa our life as a family of four began. Lola got healthy. She had a litter of puppies. That was an accident. <laughs> we knew nothing of doggy birth control. She had a full wardrobe and was spoiled with table scraps. She was always by my mom's side, including for the family photo in the church directory. It was just the two of them, since my sister wasn't in town. And everything was perfect until Lola went missing, as dogs do sometimes. And I thought my mother would never stop crying. Three years went by. My mom tried to move on and finally got a new dog. I moved out and got married and life continued. That Tuesday, after we got the voicemail, my mom decided she and I would go to the shelter together. I was a blubbering mess, the entire 20 minute drive. We were waiting at the door when they opened, which should have been a sign that my normally late mother meant business, but I was blinded in a mask of salty tears. They confirmed our information, my mother begrudgingly showed her ID, and they led us into the back kennel. It was dark and smelled strongly of ammonia and bleach. The smell would linger and slowly dissipate as we moved back down the hall into a poorly lit back room. Feces and urine replaced the sterile odor as we started to pass the cages of almost silent animals. The lack of noise suffocated the auction from the room as a reminder, this was a kill shelter. Lola was in a back left cage. When she saw me, her face turned up ever so slightly and then collapsed again in the defeat. I recognized the look of giving up and I could tell she was ready to die. They opened the cage and she lay frozen. What seemed like tears collected in the bottom lids of her eyes. We had both been through a hard time. What's wrong with her? I sobbed uncontrollably. The sheriff wouldn't look me in the eyes, but I didn't blame them. She couldn't, she could, she can't walk. She was probably caged like this, so her back legs don't work. We found her with another dog. A neighbor called it in. I leaned over and put her in my arms, blood and dander imprinted on my shirt, mixing with the snot and tears. The room stayed silent for what seemed like minutes, with the only sound being Lola struggling to breathe. Let's go! My mom was angry. I was not sure about the exit process, but I doubted it was just walking out. Before I collected my thoughts, I noticed my mother was in motion. This was quickly turning into a recon mission. She was the getaway driver, she was ready to go, and we were taking our dog. We taught, walked towards the front room and two sheriffs were waiting. We needed to sign the paperwork and pay $20? My mother wasn't paying anything and there was no fucking way in this lifetime she would pay money for anything half dead. You called me, my mother shouted at the sheriffs. I've always been impressed and scared with how aggressive my mom can be with law enforcement. <laughs> Ma'am, if you leave without paying, we'll have to call the authorities. Their badges are to control animals only. They have no legal authority in this circus. Yet, we are the clowns. My mother 
never backs down from a challenge. So our next act is leaving the sheriff animal control building to the main sheriff's office. If they're going to call the cops, we're going to beat them to it. I was along for the ride. <laughs> Three minutes down a windy back road in bumfuck North Carolina, I was cradling a dying dog and years of trauma of watching things die. This was typical. This family was skilled at not giving up, and this was not our first rodeo with animal control. When we got to the sheriff's office, they didn't really know what to make of our smelly, chaotic threesome. My mom explained Lola had been missing for three years, and she wasn't paying. Lola had then soiled both the towel and my shirt. What was a shitty situation was now shitty for everyone involved. They told us to have a seat, like it was a doctor's office, but I was sure I was gonna be handcuffed over my mother's ego, $20, and my inability to carry a wallet. And my mother, she didn't care about my crystal clean criminal record or the possible legal <laughs> ramifications. This was a matter of morals. A few minutes later, Lola starts to vomit. It was just bile, she hadn't been able to eat. My mom ran on, went on a rant. She's seen orange as the new black. She isn't afraid to do time. I, I wonder what part of the show she missed. The murders, prison riots, none of this mattered. A sheriff came out from the back, looked us all square in the face, nose turned up like he smelled the shit covering us and said, please, just go. No one's filing charges. You don't have to pay anything. Just leave. I was still sobbing. We went outside and took pictures for documentation. This circus needs receipts. My mom started Googling vets and finally started to cry herself, like a dam breaking free after three years of sadness. Grief is love with nowhere to go. I grabbed my mom's hand and held it tightly as I called my now ex-wife. She was working, and I tried to slow my tears enough so she could understand me. It's her. It's her. It's really her. I was a giddy little girl, beaming from ear to ear, laughing, crying, crying more. After a day at the vet, I took her home. My wife, who never looked angry, looked at me with disgust and disappointment. You can't bring that into the house. This woman's for you feed was legit just dogs, borderline doggy porn, but she took one look at Lola and said, no. We were newlyweds, barely married for four months, and she had said in her vows that she would eventually come home with a dog. Sadly, it was me having a full mental breakdown over a little furry bitch. What do you mean? I was ugly crying, and she was standing at the front door and the bottom of the stairs of our apartment. She had never told me no. It was something I bragged to my girlfriends about. At the time, my wife would give me the moon, but rehoming a dying, shit-covered animal was asking too much. She's going to die. Look at her. You're not going to bring a dying dog home. Lola was still wrapped in a vomit, shit-soaked towel. I was still in shock from the series of events of that day. I started to remove the towel to show her and beg for mercy. Lola had been silent until then, but could sense the rejection, because she could used all her energy to growl in April's direction. <laughs> <laughs> Ew, what the fuck? <laughs> Underneath the bile soaked towel was a lifeless six pound dog with chunks of matted hair, layers of fleas, and patches of missing skin. I was still sobbing. These weren't sad tears, it was relief. Like Lola, parts of me were ready to give up but she was my sign that it wasn't time. They say the sixth stage of grief is finding purpose. Well, 
Lola became my purpose as I grieved and grew throughout my 20s. Everything I had ever lost came back to me that day. Getting Lola back was a miracle. After establishing ground rules about bringing her in bed with us, the furniture, <laughs> who was cleaning up the poop, and a detailed care plan proposal, my wife reluctantly agreed to let me bring her into the house that day. The beginning of her rehab was rough. Everyone would comment in disgust and disbelief. Ew, is that a dog? <laughs> Who did that to her? Why does she smell like that? My little bitch was gross, but she was mine. <laughs> Open flesh and all. I was going to give her the best end to her life, even if it was palliative care. Survival was our daily practice. In the beginning, Lola chose violence when dealing with April. <laughs> Any attempt of kindness was met with a growl. Recovery was a challenge, but we were ready to beat the odds. Lola couldn't hold her bladder for more than two hours. Her back legs didn't work, and we lived in a second-story apartment. Every 90 minutes, I took her out, and she got stronger and healthier every day. When she hit different milestones, we celebrated with cocktails and puppuccinos. <laughs> when children would try to pet her, she would greet them tongue first. Her love language was dumpster diving and proceeding to fight me <laughs> over salvaged chicken wing bones. It would take another three months before Lola stopped smelling like death and her hair would start to grow. It would be four months before my wife would hold her and allow her in bed, but their bond was like no other. Lola lived another four years. She was my ride or die, from hiking to day drinking and sneaking her into work by having her play dead or just shoving her in a book bag. In her last year of life, we moved to California. She traveled cross country and saw more of the world than most dogs ever will. We found the perfect two-story house with a, with a huge yard for the dogs and a lemon tree for me. Lola got fat and happy and died. When she took her last breaths, everything in me wanted to give up too. But giving up is something I've never been good at. I can thank the women in my family for that. There's life after survival. Oh my goodness, that was Aaron Roberts, everybody.